Hi, everyone. Welcome to this evening's virtual event with Molly Ostertag in conversation with Avery Kaplan. My name is Carell Centers, and I'm the events director here at Bookshop Santa Cruz, where I'm broadcasting live. And here at Bookshop, our community is vital to us, locally, nationally, and even globally. And it's because of your continued patronage that our doors remain open. So thank you so much for spending your resources and your evening with us. And we hope you find both refuge and inspiration here tonight. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by Prism Comics, and keep an eye out on your inboxes after the event for special content just for folks who registered for the event tonight. Um, I'll be sending that out um, probably tomorrow morning, um, courtesy of Prism Comics. So tonight we will hear a conversation with Molly and Avery, and then they'll answer some of your questions. But before we get started, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the platform we're using tonight, which is Crowdcast. Um, just to, to let you know, the event is being recorded so that you can rewatch it afterwards and share it with your friends. Um, you will find that recording shortly after the event concludes. You'll find it right back on this page. So you don't need a special link or anything. You can just uh, find it right on this exact same page uh, shortly after the event concludes. Obviously, to the right side of your screen is a chat field where you can um, say where you're joining us from. I love seeing we've got folks from all over tonight, Louisiana, Boston, Santa Cruz, Cincinnati. We love to see it. We're so glad you all are here. Um, so feel free to engage with each other as create community there in that field throughout the event. If you find it distracting, no problem. You can hide that by clicking at the little arrow on the top right if you hover in that field and that will just collapse and it will go on without you. To ask your audience questions tonight, you can do that under the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of your screen. You can submit questions at any point when the talk is underway, and you can also view and upvote other questions as well. So feel free to make use of that Ask a Question tab whenever your burning question um, occurs to you. I definitely encourage you to buy the book if you have not already done so. I was telling our guests in the green room that this book has been flying off our shelves for good reason. Um, but if you have not yet purchased your copy, definitely buy the book. Your purchase also supports local jobs and independent culture and shows the publisher that our audience is invested and engaged. So thank you so much for your purchase. I also want to thank everyone who has donated to tonight's event. And if you'd like to donate, you can click on the bottom of your screen where there's that donate button. Every dollar counts and we are making our way back to um, in-person events as well. So we really appreciate all of your support. We do have some continued uh, children's programming coming up later this summer, including events with Jerry Spinelli, Lauren Tarshish, and Jewel Parker Rhodes, as well as some others. So uh, keep an eye on our calendar. I will pop that uh, those links into the chat as well. So you can subscribe to our calendar if you would like to follow us on Crowdcast. Um, but now on to the main attraction. Molly Knox Ostertag is the author and illustrator of the acclaimed graphic novels, The Witch Boy and The Hidden Witch, and the illustrator of several projects for older readers, including the webcomic Strong Female Protagonist and Shattered Warrior by Sharon Shin. She grew up in the forests of upstate New York and graduated in 2014 from the School of Visual Arts, where she studied cartooning and illustration. And um, Molly currently lives in Los Angeles, where she's joining us tonight. And tonight, Molly will be in conversation with Avery Kaplan. Avery is the author of several books and a whole bunch of comic book articles. And you can also find her writing on Comics Bookcase, Neotext, Shelf Dust, The Mary Sue, Star Trek.com, in many issues of Panel Times Panel, Panel X Panel, sorry, um, and in the margins of the books in her personal library, which is one of my favorite places to find comics. Um, I'm going to put a link to her work as well on Prism Comics, where she also writes. Avery served as a judge for the 2021 Cartoonist Studio Prize Award, and she lives in Southern California with her partner and a pile of cats. Her favorite place to visit is the cemetery. I'm so thrilled to welcome Molly and Avery to our screens tonight. So without further ado, let me go ahead and unmute, do my tech wizardry. Yay. Yay, Yay. Yay. <laughs> way to the screens. I'm so happy you both are joining us. Um, mm -hmm. I will be in the corner awaiting um, the conclusion of the event, but if you need anything along the way, just holler and I will join you back on the screen. So welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay, I have to know what cemeteries are you going to in Southern California? Because I feel like I missed the like East Coast vibe 
of cemeteries. So there's one just up the street from me in Santa mm -hmm. Ana that okay. was established in 1919. Okay. And it actually, some of the graves in it, my favorite graves, are a party that stayed where, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name, the uh, the famous party that got the Donner the Party. Donner Party. So they actually built the camp that the Donner Party stayed in the subsequent winter, and the first party survived and made yeah. it to Southern California. So. Oh my God. Okay, I have to check it out. I'm sorry to derail you. You probably had an intro. I was just like excited about local history. <laughs> I am always excited to talk about cemeteries. So, um, so as far as an intro goes, I just I'm go first. We're going to talk a little bit about the girl from the sea, and then we're just going to have a few conversations. A uh, little bit, yeah. And then we're going to have a little bit of a conversation about some of your previous work, and then we'll open it up to Q and A from the audience. That sounds great. So first and foremost, um, I don't know if all of our reader or all of your readers realize that you actually have a personal history with Nova Scotia. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that with us. Yeah. So yeah, this book is um, it's a supernatural teen romance, which is set in uh, Lunenburg, which is this tiny uh, maritime town in eastern Nova Scotia. It's so beautiful. It's so small. I was there, I, I, my family had a summer house on an island, um, kind of like right off the coast. And it was like, I know that that sounds very fancy when I say that, but like my parents were teachers. It was like a little like fisherman's cottage kind of, we didn't have like plumbing or anything. So it was very, um, very wild. But um, we would go up there every summer. Cause as I said, my parents were public school teachers. And so we would sort of all have this like big break in the summer and just go up and hang out and like eat mussels and kayak and stuff. And it was, incredible when I was a kid, like so magical and so beautiful. Um, it, there's something about that land that is like, it's really special. It's very free from pollution. Like it's very kind of like untouched. It's just starting to become a popular tourist spot, but it was like really remote when we were there. Um, and so that's so magical. But then I also like by the time I was a teenager and I was in this tiny fisherman's house on an island with like no Wi-Fi, no TV, like how many times can you read the same like 20 books that you have? A lot of times is the answer. Um, I was very, very bored and it felt very claustrophobic. And so a lot of this book comes from kind of the fantasies that I would have of just being like, I wish I would meet someone who would transform my life. And I don't know exactly what that looks like or exactly who that person is, but I would kind of just walk around like having these like, like long conversations and like sort of like imaginary interactions with people. So um, that's like, that's very much the, the root of the book and like the heart of the, the inspiration for the story. And it's, it's a place that's really special to me. So it was, it was really cool to get to draw it for this book. It felt almost like going back. It's so interesting too, because I feel like you can see a little bit of that kind of encroaching tourist trade in the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of the book kind of has like a, a thread of like gentrification and these like coastal towns that are so, special and magical and Lunenburg specifically, I think it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it's kind of preserved and very historical. And then there's always this tension between like, like the people who are really kind of committed to that lifestyle and very committed to like living this like low impact lifestyle. And then the people who kind of like want to just come and have a fun vacation, um, which I think we were sort of in the middle of those two people. But um, yeah, it was, it was, it was really cool to get to like, draw these streets and docks and like parts of this island that I that I knew really well. Um, that was like so fun. I love that. <laughs> what was it like balancing summer romance with the fantasy genre? Yeah, it's yeah. So I like I love fantasy. All of the things I've written, The Witch Boy is my previous trilogy. And that is like very, very fantasy. And then this book, I kind of it's still fantasy, but it's like a little bit. Um, that's a little bit more of like the flavor of it. Um, the main fantasy is that Kelty, the love interest of Morgan, who's our main character, Kelty is a Selkie, which is this supernatural, um, it's a Scottish legend where it's people who cared for seals and so they could kind of like appear as a seal, but their hearts were human and so they could take off their seal skin and become beautiful people and live on land. And so I was really inspired by, by that legend um, and I wanted to take it and kind of queer it both. So the classic Selkie legend is like a woman a sulky woman comes onto shore, she takes off her seal skin and she like sunbathes. Um, a fisherman, it's always a man, like sees her, steals her seal skin and then she has to marry him. And she's like a dutiful wife 
until she finds where he's hidden her seal skin. And then as soon as she finds it, she's like back in the ocean, never to return. And so I love that. There's something so, there's so much wrapped up in that story. Um, and I wanted to both queer it and then also tell a story that was about kind of giving up a seal skin. The main character, like Kelty gives up her seal skin consensually to Morgan and sort of is like, take this part of me. I want to be tied to you. And so queering that relationship, that part of the mythology was also really important. Um, but where you came on to summer, you asked about summer romance and it's very much like a, it's like, like aspirational wish fulfillment teen summer romance book. Um, and I, I wanted to explore that feeling that like, even though this is a place Morgan has lived her whole life, there just is that magical feeling during the summer where you meet people, maybe you're at a summer camp or maybe it's someone who's in town for a vacation or like, there's just like this, this freedom and this openness and this ability to meet new people and kind of grow and become someone that you wouldn't normally be. And so for Kelsey, that means taking off her seal skin and coming onto land. And for Morgan, that means allowing herself to um, be out at least just to herself and to this one other girl and to pursue the kind of relationship she's always wanted to have. So um, kind of trying to capture that whirlwind summer romance when like you kind of know that it's like it can't it's 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 just like something that like comes along and sort of seizes your life and changes your whole summer and like you're not even able to plan for the future because you you don't know what that's going to look like but you're you're just so caught up in the moment that's what i was really trying to portray with the book well and i love to i think there's kind of that push and pull where kelty so much about the rules and summer romance is so not about the rules that's kind of yeah. really interesting so was this the kind of story where you knew the ending when you started or did you find yourself getting surprised along the way? It was, um, and I, I guess I don't wanna like say what the ending is cause I don't wanna spoil it for people, but I did know what the ending was. I knew that was almost one of the first things that I, I knew was that I wanted to kind of harken back to the way that these myths always go and kind of um, also sort of like talk about make make a story that was about kind of like like these summer relationships that transform you and kind of like coming out of the summer and being like what have i learned who am i now i've changed i've been changed by this person who was so important to me um so i always knew that i how i wanted to end it i definitely i started i wrote it and then i started drawing it before i quite had like totally figured out the script um and i actually had to throw out a bunch of pages because i sort of I got into it and I was drawing this really sweet and fluffy romance, which is what it is, but there was nothing really else going on. And I was just like, there. I realized like there needs to be some conflict. Morgan needs to have like a community that she is like, she needs like a motivation for being so closeted. And, and it sort of needs to be like this group of friends that she's scared to sort of show herself to. Kelsey needs a reason for being here. Kelsey needs to really want something from Morgan besides just affection. And so figuring out all those threads, I kind of, I started drawing it. I feel like I really got the the sweetness that the two girls like the way that they interact together. And then I kind of had to go back and and bring in these more like plot plotty elements. Um, so yeah, it was it was definitely a process. And there was some some crazy diagrams of trying to figure out the selkie magic and make sure it all made sense. Um, so that was that was kind of fun. <laughs> I love that. I love a whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there are several incredible outfits in this story, from mm. Kofi's t-shirt to Morgan's dress in the third act. Did a certain character have a sense of style that specifically spoke to you? Oh, did, did she freeze? Did we lose Molly? Give it one moment. I know we were having a little bit of tech problems right beforehand. Um, just waiting for her to unfreeze. I love that question, Avery. And um, for folks that have the finished book, um, which Avery, we're gonna send you a copy, um, but she talks about the style. So I'm really excited to hear what she has to say about it. But yeah, as I was showing you earlier, there's these, um, she kind of talks about the style part of it. Um, I'm just gonna give her one more minute here. Thanks for bringing this, everyone. I know, Ma um, Molly was on her iPad, so I'm guessing it just beeped out. Just close her out and I'll reinvite her to the screen. Do, do, do. The joys of 
Virtual events. So if it's not one thing, it's another. Just one moment, folks. I am reinviting her. Oh, we've got a cemetery tip in the chat from Leslie. Oh, Mountain View in Oakland. That sounds incredible. <laughs> that does sound awesome. Oh, view in Oakland. Cool. Just one moment. Thanks, everyone. Um, I loved hearing that history about the the um the selkie myth i didn't I, I went into it not knowing about that part of the story so super loved kind of getting that how gendered it was like black and white whereas in the story it's more like like that the kind of reveal at the end too with the yeah, yeah I, was just thinking that. I was like because <laughs> <laughs> it is it's like a double dip on querying the myth it's like, exactly. a, long time. It's like yeah. a second time too yes yes totally Oh man, we're missing Molly so much. Molly, come back. Oh my gosh, the Black Dahlia is at Mountain View in Oakland. That's, that's Ooh. really interesting. Ooh. Wow. Got some cemetery fans in the crowd tonight. All right, give it just one more moment. Um, thanks for bearing with us, folks. Um, yes, there was a desktop. Um, shenaniganery happening right before the event. So um, so Molly hopped on her iPad, but uh, give us one more minute here. Thanks everyone. And you can take this moment, if you have not done so, you can pop your questions into the ask a question. Looks like Molly is accepting back the screen request. Purgatory Brook. I'm loving all this cool um, yeah. stuff in the chat right now. Purgatory Brook, that's so atmospheric. Yeah, really <laughs> Molly, welcome back. Can you hear us? I've never used this platform before. It just keeps like booting me off. I'm really sorry, Does guys. Keep booting you up? I'm so no, I'm sorry that you're having tech problems. I hope um I hope that it doesn't boot you off again, but we're so glad you're back. Um I'm so, <laughs> no, you know, the other thing too is um, I might, we could turn your, your, sometimes the image can be a little much, so we could try just your voice as well, if that, we can try it. Yeah, see. I mean, my internet is good. I'm not, I think it's the program, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. <laughs> I've, yeah, unfortunately, I have heard issues with, with folks with the platform before, so I'm so sorry yeah. you're having trouble. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's talk about get, as much as we can. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's talk some more about the tech stuff. Um, but Avery, you had just asked a super compelling question about the fashion, and I'm going to hand that back to Molly and hide in the corner again. So thank you so much for bearing with us. Um, Molly, would you like me to read the question again? Oh, no. Oh, oh man. I'm going to try turning her. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Molly, Molly I'm going to turn your video off and just see what happens. Is that OK? Mm -hmm. Is that any better? Gosh, I don't know that she can hear us. Hmm. Molly. Oh. Hmm. Hi again. Okay. Can you? Can you it's it's a bit blocky. Um, I'm gonna try toggling your video off. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Can you? Yeah. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can yes. hear you. Yay, okay, okay, let's try that. Sorry, folks, we'll, we'll get to hear Molly and maybe um, see if this works better, so. Okay. So yeah, getting into the fashion of the book, um, and just please give me like a hand sign or something if I go, if if I tap out of this. But um, yeah, I, I was, Kelsey, or Mor Morgan, um, her dream is to go to school for fashion, and so she, like a lot of queer people, I think, is really interested in the ways that our clothes kind of shape us and pre present us to the world. And so she was a really fun character to kind of dress as I was as I was doing the book because she starts out, she's like very meticulously dressed and like really kind of is um, really good at kind of blending in with her friends. And then as the book goes, she gets a little bit more comfortable looking, kind of like more out there, more eccentric, more queer. And so her, her final dress, which I'm I'm glad you mentioned because I was really proud of it um, in the last scene is just like this like really pretty and like unusual dress that doesn't look like something you would see in a small town. Um, and I was really, really 
there's something about like her kind of, it, it took a long time to figure out what that dress would be and like what that look would be. And it was, it was just cool to find something that felt very kind of unusual for her. Um, also more, or Kelty, who has never really needed clothes before and who lives as a seal in the ocean and like has a seal skin and that's all she's got. Um, she like doesn't care about clothes at all. And so she's very into like, oh my God, this shirt has like beautiful airbrush dolphins on it. So like, this is the, like, how could anything be better than this? Um, and so that was very fun too. And she's probably, I think I'm a little bit in between the two. I like, I like, I like, a, I like myself a giant airbrush shirt, but I'm also like, I, I definitely think about what I wear. Um, and so kind of that focus on fashion was really, really fun to do with Morgan in these subtle ways. I love that. Okay, my last question on Girl from the Sea is, is it possible we'll see more of Morgan and Kelty in the future? It's definitely a, a one-off book, um, which I know is disappointing, but I, I, I love them. I miss drawing them. I would, I've been sort of wanting to draw them again, but feeling like I, I want to kind of let the book be out there a little bit first. But um, yeah, it's very much the kind of story where I just, I felt like, I don't know. I felt like I felt like I told the story in the amount of pages that it was, and I felt like it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And maybe I'll one day figure out a new story for these characters. But it felt like they really kind of like did the growing that they needed to do in the pages of the book. So, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Such a lovely book. It's it really is amazing. So thank you. Okay, so now I've just got some questions that are sort of more general for you. Um, and so I've interviewed you a few times for the beat and we've yeah. talked a little bit about your, how you like to go camping. And so yeah. I, I was hoping you would talk a little bit about that and your favorite camping snacks. Oh my gosh. That's a, that's a very lovely question. Um, yeah. And I would, I would definitely go camping in Nova Scotia too, which was really fun. We would sometimes like kayak to an Island and kayak camp, which is like the coolest. Um, but yeah, I went camping recently. It was by myself. It was like a solo trip, which was exciting. Um, cause I, I, I needed like, I needed that after a year of like, like sharing space with my wife who like, I love very, very, very much. But I was like, we really haven't spent a night apart in so long. Like I, I want to go just be in the woods and stare at a fire. Um, and while I was there, I brought a lot of random food. I think the weirdest snack I made was I had a pan, a cast iron pan that I've been cooking bacon in. And then I fried, I wrapped some apple pieces in brie and then I fried them in the bacon grease. And that was really good. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So some of your previous work includes the Witch Boy trilogy, which is back there. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how the fantasy in that trilogy differs from Girl from the Sea. Yeah, it's um, the Witch Boy is definitely more of a, a fully fleshed out fantasy world. I mean, it still does take place in this world, but um, it's it's yeah. There's like all these like magical. This book was really cool to kind of just have there be one kind of this this mysterious encounter with a single person who may, maybe there's a whole world of magic and selkies out there, but we don't really get to see it. It's really about the single person. Um, and the Witch Boy too, I think I, I wrote that series and especially the first book when I was like pretty young. Um, I wrote it before I had come out to myself really or to like other people. And so I was really interested in using magic almost as a, a metaphor for queerness and to kind of explore queerness through these like, like terms that weren't very loaded and were kind of just like invented for my world. Um, and then that's like, I think it like worked well for that book, but this book I really wanted to be much, much more textual about the queerness and to kind of have the magic in it be more of a, a subtle metaphor when it came to um, queer themes. So I think this book, the themes of shape-shifting and the themes of not quite fitting in on land and being sort of pulled in between two different places, like those all feel very, very queer to me, but it's definitely in a little bit of a, a more subtle way um, than I think The Witch Boy was like very on the nose. So it was also, yeah, The Witch Boy was funny too, because I kind of wrote the first book and um, like didn't really plan to make more. And then when Scholastic was interested in more and I really liked the characters, so I wanted to continue. It was this like retroactively trying to figure out the entire world and figure out like what I'd established and what made sense. And so that was kind of, kind of fun and challenging. So this book, I got to just do it all in one. 
That, the Witch Boy trilogy comes across so well structured as a trilogy too. So it's kind of surprising to hear that to me. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, so as you as was mentioned earlier, you have previous experience with web comics. Can you tell us a little bit about how making a web comic compares with making a graphic novel? Yeah. Making a webcomic was kind of my first foray into comics. Um, I made Strong Female Protagonist, which was written by my friend Brennan Lee Mulligan, who's now like an internet famous dungeon master for D&D, which I think is amazing for him. And I was the, I illustrated it and we it went for a long time. It was seven years. Um, and I really did, I learned a lot of consistency from that and of the, this kind of ethos that I carry forward into all my comics of just like, you have to just get the page done. like. Ultimately, people care the most about the big story. And so you have to kind of put the page out there and the drawings are not going to be perfect, but you'll get another chance to do them. Um, and so that has really kind of helped me in my working process on graphic novels to not be too precious with things. Um, but I will say it was very stressful, like putting out a comic a page at a time and sort of seeing people assume where things were going and jump to conclusions before the scene had finished was really stressful and kind of not um I, I didn't like love that that process like it felt like we kind of like like had to constantly be like addressing things in the middle of the flow of the story whereas if it was a graphic novel it was like it would take you five minutes to read the scene and see what we're saying but a web comic it was like a, a web comic that came out one page a day was like yeah, it's, it'll take months before the scene is over. And so everyone's like mad at us for months until we sort of like reveal what the scene is about. And yeah, that was that was a little scary. Um, so I, I definitely, I think at this point, I really enjoy doing comics in books. Um, the exception and the thing I've been doing recently has been a lot of kind of comics made specifically for the internet and my like fan work. I've done like Lord of the Rings comics, but then like more seriously, I've done like personal comics where they're just this really long scroll and it's just images and you just scroll through it. It really only works online. It doesn't really, you can't really print it out. And there's something so fun and freeing about that of kind of breaking out of the page and breaking out of the panel and just um, being like the only rule to this is that just that you read downwards and kind of playing with that. So that's been really fun. I think I, I, I will always love posting work online. There's something really special about that that medium and about getting to post it and immediately get feedback. Um, but yeah, for, for long form stories like this, I'm, I'm definitely gonna stick to graphic novels for now. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> so I did wanna talk a little bit about Lord of the Rings with you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you just published a beautiful essay on Polygon. I think yesterday it went yeah. up. Yeah, yes. But, I would encourage everyone to look up and read because it's gorgeous. But I was hoping you could just talk to us a little bit about your relationship with Lord of the Rings and how it's inspired you over the years. Yeah, um, it's, you know, it's it was very much a uh, pandemic, like escapism hobby um, to like let myself go really deep into this world that I hadn't gone deep in since I was a child. Um, but to me, Lord of the Rings really, represents escapism um and not in a bad way as in running away from your problems but a way of finding these like deeper truths about love and hope in the world and finding them through fantasy and also that feeling of being transported to another world and so that is something that i really look for in media and i really try to put in my own work um and it's one of the reasons i love making comics so much is that i i never feel closer to that feeling of being in another world than when I'm kind of like deep in the middle of making the comic and it feels so real and the characters feel like such living people. Um, and so that's, yeah, yeah, that's, I think like, like Lord of the Rings, it, it's just one of those things that like I read it, I had it read to me when I was so, so young. And so it really is just the baseline for what fantasy is to me. Um, and so I think everything I do, even though I don't think most of my work is really similar to it at all, it's like that's definitely like a baseline that I'm coming from really admire and so that's that's kind of also something I, I try to capture of just being like how can you tell these epic or magical stories and then also make them stories about very small people having like emotions um 
yeah, so that's 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 the root of my love for it. <laughs> and my yeah, they just posted the link to my piece. I'm very proud of it. I did a lot of research to prove that Lord of the Rings is queer intentionally. <laughs> it, it's a breathtaking piece. I really encourage everyone to read Thank it. You so much. <laughs> I'm really proud of it. Honestly, it was like a lot of work and it was it was so fun to do. And that was its own form of escapism, too, because I was like, let me I was always a little bit afraid to look at the person who had written the book because I was like, what if it really ruins it for me? But then the more I dug in, the more I was like, I mean, obviously, like he had his problems. He was a white man in the 20th century, but like he, he was such an interesting person and such an interesting big mind. And it was really cool. It, it, it felt like it enhanced my enjoyment of the story. One of those details you shared in the piece too, really, were very illuminating. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was that was fun, and so yeah, and that was it was cool to just. It's been it, like I never really engaged with fandom as a kid or a teenager or ever really. I wasn't that into fandom, and to kind of let myself go there in the pandemic, and then also be like, okay, I like this fan stuff, but also I have to like, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this, and I'm gonna find out if it's real or not. Um, was really fun and just I think how my, my brain works where I just I want stories to be queer and I want to be able to find us like and find myself in, in stories and I, I it's, it's always really rewarding to be able to do that. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to go into some of the Q&A from the audience. Great. So Jeff asks, what is the balance for you between illustrating and writing? Do you do both at the same time as you create a book or do you tend to lead with one first and let the other follow? Yeah, I, I definitely come in with ideas and I start writing, but very early on, there's also a lot of trying to draw the characters and figure out sort of who they are, what their interactions might be, what key scenes might be. And so before I'm starting to figure out the plot, it really starts with a feeling and the drawings are a great way to capture that. Um, and then once I'm sort of feeling solid about that, I go into the nitty gritty of the plot, making sure everything makes sense, figuring everything out with like, how do these characters talk? And like, what's, what are they doing in every scene basically? Um, and then I can, I can fully go into drawing it. So I try really hard to, write everything out before I start drawing because drawing is so much labor. But like I said, on this book, I drew 50 pages and then threw them out because it just wasn't clicking. So sometimes you can't figure things out until you get into the drawing um, and start to start to really like, like understand how, how the characters are moving and what they want. Um, so there's, yeah, there's, there's this very fun intuitive process of like, I basically know what the story will be when I start drawing it, but then a lot of times the dialogue will change or scenes will change slightly as it kind of, as I feel like I get to know the characters better. Um, and that's, that's it's very cool. There, that's something so like intimate about graphic novels and about making a graphic novel that I, I've never quite experienced anywhere else where I just, there's this visual component where you're kind of getting to meet them and you're getting to sort of almost like be the actor who's like controlling them and it's, it's really, it's really cool. And it always like gives me new insights. Um, the example I always use for the girl from the sea is there's some extras in the back of the book. And there's one sketch where I kind of figured out, I was just drawing them a lot and like trying to draw them interacting and seeing what the vibes were and realizing that I could draw Morgan, like really skinny, really tall and angular and sharp. And like, she's just like always kind of awkward and always holding herself really tensely. And then Kelty, who is kind of this wild force who sweeps into her life is like, curvy and covered in freckles and giant crazy hair and she's just, she has like these like really fluid movements and like moves with her whole body and figuring out that kind of visual contrast like I wouldn't have figured that out without just sort of letting my my hands my drawing hands like do the thinking so and that really kind of like helps me figure out the, the core of the book. Fascinating. Aside, okay, so Rebecca asks, aside from Lord of the Rings, what is the most queer, non-explicitly queer fantasy? Oh man, that's a hard question. You know, you know my, ans my answer is always Lord of the Rings when people ask me stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I love reading queerness into things, but I love reading queer stories more. And I think there's there's been something very cool about going back to classics um and and finding these queer themes that couldn't quite be articulated um i was just talking with a friend today sorry this isn't really fantasy at all but i was talking with a friend about um rebecca by daphne de Maurier, 
and how it's this, it's on its face, it's this like gothic murder mystery kind of like romance thing. But then when you dig into it and when you really read the book as a queer person, you're like, oh, this feels powerfully trans mask in this really interesting way where this like young person marries this like older man and is obsessed with him and it's like kind of just wants to be him. And it's really, really interesting. And then when you go and read about Daphne du Maurier's life, that was like a theme in that author's life where like, like the dressed as a boy for their entire childhood and like had like, like really hated like being like a wife and a mother and having to have those duties. And so I really just love going to old stuff and kind of, kind of looking at it with a, a fresh eye. Um, but yeah, I'm not a fan of, I don't love like a queer bait. I don't love queer baiting. Like I don't love being queer baited. So that's like really not something that I, I, I go for. And I think that that was why, like with Lord of the Rings, I was like, I really want to prove that this is real. And that's also why I want to make stories is because I just, I think that we just like deserve to get those stories. <laughs> well, it's so nice when you get the queerness and the fantasy both together, yeah. like in Girls from Sea. Yes, exactly. Okay, so Rob asks, what kind of music inspired you during the writing drawing process? Would you ever make a playlist for the story that readers can listen to? Oh man, I should. Um, I have one that I, I don't think it's public on my Spotify, but I, yeah, I, I tried to listen to a lot of like lesbian teen music when I was trying to get into the headspace. Um, when I was writing it, Haley Kiyoko had just released her first album, which I think is called Expectations. Um, she's like a lesbian singer songwriter. And it was, that was really lovely. There's, it's kind of this like dreamy, like, like SoCal beach music and it, that really like gave me a lot of inspiration. So that was one of the big ones. Um, yeah, I think if there was a playlist, there'd be like some Girl in Red on there. There'd be some Janelle Monae, I'm trying to think of like who like really exemplifies, but, but yeah, yeah. I tried, I tried to kind of be like, okay, what are like the teenage lesbians on my Twitter timeline <laughs> listening to right now? Um, and that was what I listened to. Okay, Anna asks, what was the inspiration for you to start writing draw and drawing? Did it come from seeing another's work or was it more like a random thought? I mean, just in general, um, I, like as a kid, I think all kids draw and write and tell stories. That's just like a really natural thing that we do as, as people. That's like a, just a human behavior. Um, I was really, really privileged and really lucky to have a supportive family who, um, like uh, encouraged me in my drawing and my writing. Uh, my grandpa was a literary agent. And so I, I, there was like some little connection to kind of like knowing that that was a real job that you really could do is like, you can actually be a writer. These books don't just materialize, people actually do them. And so I think that that is, it's such a huge privilege to, to be able to have that. And so I'm always kind of like trying to be visible for kids who maybe don't have that figure in their life to be like, you can actually do this job. You can, your stories can have a place to be told. Um, yeah, and then I I always told stories. I think I, I, I always drew, but I didn't think to combine them until like in comic form until high school when I started reading comics like Sandman or Sandman by Neil Gaiman or Persepolis, Persepolis by, uh, oh my God, who's that by? Do you have it? I don't know if the top I head. totally blanked. <laughs> I'll search it. Mark, I mind just want to blank. I think okay. Persepolis, beautiful graphic novel. But I started reading things like that, and I was like, oh, it's you can like actually tell stories that are not just superhero stories, um, which is what I thought they were, uh, which is what I thought all comics were. Um, and so that was that was really really cool. Um, yeah, and then I just I think for a while I thought that I had to write prose to be taken seriously. And I had to write like, you know, from the perspective of like a white man who's like, like kind of womanizing and like drinking whiskey or whatever. Like I definitely have some really bad uh, uh, college writing that's like that. And then at a certain point I was like, I kind of just want to do my own thing. Um, when I went to school for, when I went to art school, um, I kind of like, like absorbed the idea that I couldn't write and draw at the same time. So I was like, I guess I'll draw and I'll draw other people's stories. And then at a certain point, I was just like, man, I'm getting so frustrated with like people asking me to draw things that I don't really wanna draw. So like, why don't I just sit down and write something that I do wanna draw? Um, so yeah, that was that's kind of how I, I have arrived at this place right now, which is a very nice place to be in. 
Joy asks, what kind of comics or stories are your favorites? Um, I like, I like so, so many different things. Also, there's like a little echo, it's fine. Um, I really like stories that are very focused on the character and that are on like, even if it is a really big story, especially if it's a big story, things that are about um, the like, like, emotions that are going on with that character. I just started rewatching Doctor Who, which was my like big obsession in high school. And that was such, that's such a cool show because it's um, about this like, like high sci-fi time travel, all this crazy stuff, but it's always comes down to like the humans who are traveling with this person, with this like extraterrestrial person and how they feel about it. And so that kind of connection is really important for me when I'm engaging with any kind of work. Um, yeah, and like obviously, I love queer stories. I love when we get to have messy queer stories and aspirational queer stories and stories that are kind of wish fulfillment for things that we've never gotten to see before. Um, that's really important to me. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I, I I like a lot of things. Um, the the prerequisite is usually just that it's kind of made with like some kind of like like core of of optimism or or kindness because I think I, I get very I just don't really. I don't really like like cynical pieces of work as much. Um, so I like when there's kind of a, a core of like belief or like at least interest in characters and like interest in their interiority. That's my my favorite. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So Lauren asks, the dynamics between Morgan and her friends felt true to life, especially for teenagers. The chat logs in particular were a cool inclusion and offered a glimpse into their lives. How did you decide on the different ways to display the group dynamics? Yeah, the chat logs were a little bit of a, a later addition. And I'm, I felt, I honestly felt so galaxy brain for figuring it out because it was like, I can establish all this stuff about characters without showing them. And if you haven't read it, the book, there's sort of interstitial, um, group chats where you get to see what Morgan's friends are saying. And notably, you get to see how Morgan is like responding less and less to this this group. Um, yeah, and it was just, it was fun. It was scary. I think I posted on Twitter when I was writing this and I was like, hey teens, how do you do group chats? Like, <laughs> what's, what's up with that? And I got a variety of responses. Most people were like, don't, that's such an embarrassing question. Like we're just <laughs> people, <laughs> like just write us like people. And I was like, I know, but do you emojis like, <laughs> Do you say LOL or is that something from my generation? Um, so yeah, that was that was fun. Am I still here? Can you still hear me? I can still hear. Oh, okay, cool. Well, she just jumped away. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was yeah, like getting into that and kind of just typing out these group chats as though I was each of these girls was really, really fun. I kind of based it on like my own personal group chats with my friends and then um, especially Serena is kind of based on someone I knew in high school who was this, you know, seems to have it all together, but is kind of like more clingy and more insecure than you would realize at first, um, but puts out this very like, like cool and together face. Um, yeah, and I, I also like an early draft of the book, um, the one that I was mentioning of sort of throwing out was it, the girls were much more typical kind of like mean teens, like pretty mean girls. and. I, at a certain point, I was just like, I don't know anyone like this. And I hate seeing this in movies. Like it's such a basic kind of like misogynistic take. And like, why am I replicating it here just because I need conflict? And so digging into who these girls were and how, like what they added to Morgan's life and the fact that they are all good friends, but they just, she doesn't feel comfortable being herself with them yet. Um, and there's reasons for that, but it's not like no one has to be like an evil cartoon villain for that to happen. Um, so that was, I felt like the book really started to come together when I started to write in those girls' voices and really gave them their own their own stories. That's very insightful. <laughs> okay, the next question is from Christy. What did you read as a child that may inspire your writing today? Were you always a fantasy fan? Yeah, I was a huge, huge fantasy fan as a kid. Um, honestly, less so as an adult. I'm very picky about my fantasy. Um, and I it just it has it just has to be it has to be good. If it's not good, I can't do it. Um, but as a kid, I, I consumed every single thing that I could find. I was a big Tamara Pierce fan. She has a lot of books that like 
um, are very much about like strong women kind of uh, uh, living in this like very classic high fantasy worlds, um, but being very grounded and very kind of practical in a way that was really fun for me. Um, I loved authors like Diana Wynne Jones and Diane Duan, who kind of pulled on mythology and pulled on um, Ursula Le Guin is another one who like really made these stories that felt like they could be mythologies of their own. Um, I was an Animorphs kid. Animorphs was like very cool. <laughs> Speaking of like cool teen dynamics, like I love that book so much. And so, yeah, I was I was into a lot of a lot of different fantasy. And then I kind of I remember like like reading everything in the children's section at our tiny library, and then like moving to the adult fantasy section, which was like two shelves, and reading a bunch of like sort of truth things that were really inappropriate, and like Miss of Avalon, which is like you should not read when you're eleven. Um, so that's how I learned about lots of adult things. <laughs> but yeah, I was I was just voracious for that kind of invented world. And I think I'm still always trying to find it now. It's just I'm an adult, so it's a little bit harder now, you know. It's it's yeah, those sort of truth novels really were. Yeah. <laughs> they are wild. Like I remember yeah. there's like dragons and swords on the cover. So I was like, this shit is probably for me. And like it's not. <laughs> it was not for me. <laughs> well, and then Animorphs is kind of wild in another way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's you know, another scholastic series and like so much respect to how they show like these like intensity of teen emotion. It's just I loved I love the books that did take it. I don't know, I, I just didn't want to feel talked down to in books. And so whenever I could sense that, that was like really, really annoying to me. Um, so like something like Animorphs where it's like, yeah, maybe you're fighting in a war and you have trauma. And it's like, also your friend is mad at you. And also you're turning into a otter, like just like. Yeah. <laughs> in the most horrifying like, I, way possible. I, yes, in like a true body horror way. I was like, I can relate to this. <laughs> um. So Jeff asks, he well, first he comments that he's such a witch fan. And then he oh. asks, what drew you to the genre of witches for your first book? Um, as I said, I just loved fantasy. Um, and I was kind of with that book, it's it's exploring um gender norms and it's this specific magical family where all the women have like one type of magic and all the men have another type of magic. And that's like that's their rules, that's how they perceive it. And so it's like about uh, boy who wants to do the the witch magic um and that was it was almost a little bit based on growing up in upstate new york which is where i was when i wasn't in nova scotia where there was this like very intense new age community um and so like i'm so lucky i don't have religious trauma i'm like the one gay person who doesn't have religious trauma but it was really interesting being in this more like um hippy dippy new age like oh the mother earth goddess thing where i it sometimes felt very restrictive in its own way and so that was something that I really wanted to explore. Um, and then also aesthetically, potions, herbs, runes, it's just so compelling. I really enjoyed, like so often with books, I'm just trying to figure out what I wanna draw for like 200 pages. And so that was one where I, it just felt very, very intuitive to me to, to draw that kind of magic system. I loved all those runes so much too. Yeah, I get so many, so many kids ask me like how, how you pronounce that when I'm like, I can't tell you it's magic. It's it's it would cause a problem if I told you. <laughs> it's the perfect answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And Rebecca asks, what is the value of headcanon? Yeah. Okay. And I'll also define it because I don't know if like I don't know how common that term is outside of like internet fandom, but headcanon is reading something and coming up with an idea for the characters. Um uh, that is not sort of like confirmed in the book. And so a lot of times a headcanon is like thinking that someone is is trans or is queer or that there is a relationship going on that is not textually in the book. Um, and I love it. I think it is a really imaginative and creative act of reading. It's it's I always feel that reading is very much this exchange between the writer and the reader and you bring so much to it. And so I've I've definitely had some of my most pleasurable like reading and then also like watching experiences when I kind of let myself go off in a headcanon and be like, okay, but this movie would be so great if it was like a lesbian relationship. So let's, let's kind of like explore that and, and kind of pretend that that's what's happening. And you can get so much out of that. Um, I think it's very valuable. I think that like the act of imagination to see ourselves in big mainstream media is, um, 
like a very it's very radical to do when you're a queer person i will say that i i get tired of it too i think that we deserve a lot more than that and there's kind of this some at a certain point i think that projecting as a queer person projecting your identity on straight characters who are intended to be straight who are written by straight people i think it gets very wearying and like there's only so much you can learn from that and so i i just saw someone recommended cemetery boys in the chat there's so many good novels shows movies by queer authors about queer people and those are the ones where i feel actually very seen and very spoken to um i can have fun you know, being like, I don't know, watching a Marvel movie and being like, like watching like Star Wars and being like, wow, maybe Finn and Poe are boyfriends. Like that can be fun for me, but I'm not going to learn something about myself or see a, a queer truth that like is like complicated and interesting in that way. I'm only gonna find that when I go to like works by other queer authors. So yeah, I both love headcanon and I love fan fiction. And I also think like I have so much respect for um, people who are out, out here like actually making these like canon texts because they're very, very important. Definitely. Okay, Annabelle says, I just wanted to say I really like your work and what are some differences between writing prose comics for TV? Oh yeah, thank you, Annabelle. Um, yeah, they're all, they're all very different mediums. Um, comics are definitely the most natural for me. And like I said, there's this, process of very um, intimate discovery as you're working on a comic where it really is this interplay between the story you've written and the characters you're drawing. And it's, I mean, sometimes you write for an artist, but specifically with books like The Girl from the Sea, when it's all one creator, it's really, really cool to kind of, um, uh, it's, just, it's just like, there's not really a visual medium like that in any other way, where it's just one creator getting to sort of tell their story. Um, TV is much more, structured um there's things like like episodes have to be usually in animation it's like 11 minutes or 22 minutes there's always going to be a commercial break at a certain time so that's where your act break is so it's very there's a lot more rules to writing a satisfying tv episode um just in terms of the structure as well as what you could actually show on tv um and so for comics i comics are definitely my favorite thing because i find that there's all this subtlety in the the visuals and in the way the characters are interacting um, I've only written prose for like fan fiction, but I did really enjoy it too. And I kind of would like to explore it more because that to me, I got to explore the character's interiority in a way that I haven't gotten to do in animation or comics. So really how is the character seeing the world and what's going on in their head? That is something that prose is very, very special for. So I think, I think different kinds of stories work really well in all of these different mediums and it's kind of figuring out how to tell the story you want and how the medium will, will work for you. Excellent. Well, that is all of our questions and we are coming up on an hour. So is there anything else that you'd like to, to say before we adjourn? Oh gosh. Um, I think, I think it's all good. Let me try to come back on screen just to like say, say go high. <laughs> Can you see me? Yeah, we can see it. Yay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just thank you so much for having me. And I really love Prism Comics and the work that y'all do. And um, it's it's like, it's such an honor to, to be here chatting with you about this stuff. I, I truly could talk about it for like another five hours. So we'll have to get <laughs> drinks sometime. Yeah, well, and hopefully we'll be able to actually see each other at a convention soon at the Prism booth. I would love that so much. I miss it. I miss it a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did, never thought I would miss comic conventions. And, and yet here I am. I'm like, I would do anything to pay $15 for a bad hot dog at the San Diego Comic Convention Center. <laughs> I really went through it last July because at first I was like, oh, you're off. Great. great. And then like partway through, I was like, nope. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's important. It's, I miss, it's been, like like sorry i'm gonna go off for one sec i know we're about to By all means. but like um th there's been such an interesting uh, uh shift in queer discourse in the last year because it has all taken place so online and so often so publicly and i um i think that there's positives to that there's people who can weigh in who like whose voices aren't usually heard but i also so much miss the experience of sitting down with people and other creators and just talking about stuff and kind of like not doing it in a, a public way, I guess, and kind of figuring out 
there's so much growth there. And so I'm I'm really excited to get to meet every meet people in person again. Yeah, truly. Well, and you don't really realize how much energy you get out of those little moments and things like yeah, that. But exactly. like you don't get when you're only doing the one hour conversation. Yeah. What happens between. Yeah. This is so lovely though. And I'd love, I just love like seeing that people show up for this. So thank you guys so much. It, it's very, it's I mean, it's very, very sweet to show up. Yeah, this was outstanding. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you to Bookshop Santa Cruz for hosting. Thank you guys so much. I'm gonna stay with my screen off because it like I don't want to ruin the magic of that the tech is working. But um, Avery, you are such an incredible interlocutor. Thank you for rolling with the punches. And um, I didn't want to like leave you all alone up on the screen. But then when my internet cut, I was like, oh, now I get to see your whole life. Like, this is awesome. Like <laughs> I like seeing you take up the screen. So anyway, thank you for your wonderful questions and your wonderful presence here tonight. And Molly, so thrilled that you for your book and for your success. And I hope that we get to welcome you back. To the store um in person, maybe um avery hopefully you can come up as well um so uh lovely audience thank you so much again the recording is available here thank you to prism comics um and we hope to see you at a future event thank you so much everyone take care thank you thank you Bye.